Well, thanks again for inviting me. And um, I feel a little bit of a fraud standing up here, summarising some interesting local, fantastic local work um, that I've not been involved with at all and I really don't know much about. And so I was a little bit nervous about being invited to do this and uh, I started to think, oh, I'm going to sound really patronising or self-centred in terms of trying to fit in my own experiences. But actually, what I've heard today is actually really refreshing and I hope you... Um, took the point home that I was making there, that I think the passion uh, that, that you guys obviously have in terms of having survived this long in a, in, a, in a diverse economic, political and social climate is actually testament to the fact that you should have no worries about the, the, your 50th. And I'm going to pick up on a... F I'm going to do something that, um, very briefly, and I won't talk for too long, I promise. Uh, Jill mentioned five polite C words. Um, I can't remember them all now, or even one of them, but I'm going to mention two plus a third at the end. Okay? I think I've mentioned one already, but I'll come back to that. So she mentioned evolution. And basically, what I've heard today is a society that has rode out the storms of all the things that have happened over the last decades, uh, very much like um, universities and the, and the higher academic sector, uh, very much like the museum sector, and they're all in interlinked. And clearly today what we've heard from all the speakers um, with different perspectives, different bits of information and different jobs is just how those things are interlinked through time. So it's really interesting as archaeologists that we're looking at, we were discussing the recent past today in terms of how um, societies, uh, the society has developed. And this evolution has occurred, um, and I can speak a little bit from experience, certainly in that key period of uh, what Norman mentioned of PPG 16 and the professionalism or the professionalization of the archaeological discipline. And I think he mentioned the word commercialization because that's exactly what it was. Um, I worked for nine years in uh, a unit very much like Sue based in, uh, she was based in um, Durham at the time. I was based in, in York University, but we were funded by English Heritage. And we went through this entire process of PPG 16, implementing evaluations, assessments, uh, dealing with curators uh, and, and people in Norman's position through in terms of specifications, then advising professional units. We had nothing to do with any uh, community organisations whatsoever. And I think um, Norman made that point really clear. Uh, and at that point, there was a massive disconnect between the profession um, and academia as well and what wasn't called community archaeology then. I can't remember what it was called. It was just called public archaeology. Maybe not even that. And they were, and, and a lot of the professional groups I remember um, uh, were pretty sniffy and a little bit disrespective of the enthusiasm, enthusiasm and the skills that actually community archaeology um, groups had. Rob mentioned a sand pit for adults. Well, that was uh, certainly a view by some professional practitioners about community archaeology. But I would say, being on the other side of that, a lot of the, the professional units, which shall remain nameless for obvious reasons, were also sand pits for uh, adults because some of the work that they were doing was pretty, pretty abysmal. Uh, and because of the commercialization professionalism, um, it was all about money and therefore the practice and the um, expertise that was needed to undertake that practice uh, may not have been as good as it should be. There was an awful lot of um, confusion about how this, this um, process went through. It was all very well on paper, and I'm not sure whether Sue would agree with me or not, but implementation of evaluations, or, or what definitions of an evaluation, an assessment, a technical report, an excavation, a post-excavation report, a publication, merged into this mess of... Um, Confusion for both the developers, for ourselves in, the, in, in practicing it, and, from, and for the wider world. And that meant that things like evaluations became shortcuts for publications. And uh, Norman mentioned the grey literature that exists and the, the, um, the preservation through record. Well, believe me, a lot of that record is dire. It's actually dire. And as archaeologists, as a profession, a lot of the data that we collected, a lot of the sites that we have... Um, excavated are essentially gone forever and we've destroyed them. The developer hasn't done it. We've done it because we haven't actually got those great records. I think 
That's not across the board, of course. There were some excellent people working in those uh, commercial units. There were some excellent people working in advisory roles, but there weren't. Uh, and I think that's still um, that's less of an issue now. But it was a period, uh, like many major changes um, through other dis other um, disciplines and um, and jobs, things change and people catch up a little bit slowly. University has gone through exactly the same sort of evolutionary process, uh, with exactly well very different but very similar kinds of problems. So we had a lot of universities in the 1970s and 80s had, because of the, um, the structure of uh, the DOA and the funding, had good active archaeological units. Most of those have now gone um, because they became too expensive and the universities were unwilling to subsidize them unless they were bringing in 40% of their, of their um, income as overhead to the university, which is not, d did not make them competitive with the people who were working from their kitchen sinks. So there was an issue with quality, there was an issue with professionalism, and a lot of the very good practice-based uh, archaeology in those units uh, disappeared pretty quickly or went uh, diluted into some of the commercial, into the commercial world. Um, we went through the same issues of, of uh, lack of funding. We went through the same issues in universities of um, uh, decrease in um, staff members. We also are now grappling, or have been for the last few years, with a similar kind of uh, concept of engagement with the outside world. So now we have this something called the impact agenda, where we now have to not only undertake excellent teaching, excellent research, and produce um, academic publications of the highest quality of international standards, so we get a tick in the box every five, six years, and rated, ranked in a league table. We also now have to actually uh, con concern ourselves, and it's not a bad thing, although it's very confusing for us uh, uh, how it's actually been presented, with how we, deliver the, how we deliver and make the world a better place in terms of our own Im the impact of our research. And that's where you guys are now crucial in this, because this whole re-engagement with the outside world, which kind of was lost for a while, is now coming back onto the agenda. Museums are really key in this too. They've gone through the same kind of uh, roller coaster of an evolution cuts, lack of funds. We heard from Norman, the whole, the whole bunch of museums closed in Lancashire. Um, museums are under pressure, uh, very much so, in terms of how they are resourced and, and what they are supposed to be doing. And there's a little bit of confusion uh, or a loss of identity, just like there is in the university sector. I mean, are, we, are we training people vocationally? Are we training people to think? What's the role of a university? Well, people are asking the same questions about museums now. And the museums have a very, very white hot spotlight on them in terms of their funding. What I think museums, and maybe we don't do as well as we could, is to actually show just how cool and how exciting, but also how important a lot of the stuff we have and that we do, particularly the collections in, in museums, both local, regional, and, and national museums, can actually address bigger questions, climate change, uh, social change. You know, nothing exists in a vacuum. It's all about where we are, where we came from. And um, I can't remember who mentioned this earlier, but basically joining the past to the present, which is essentially the theme of this workshop or this, this conference, is exactly how we can be engaging and making what we do much more relevant. And I've realized that with my own work over a long period of time. I'm interested in certain things, very specific things to do with the linking biology um, and culture and the past. But I'm beginning to realize some of the things we do now are actually relevant to medics, to biomedics, to people who are interested in evolutionary anthropology, for people who are interested in climate change. And we have fantastic data sets. Because we were focusing in a tunnel, thinking about our own stuff, we tend not to realize this bigger impact, going back to the impact agenda. And the last thing I really want to say, and the, the, the final word, um, is this city, for me, I'm new to it, is surprising. It's a bit of a jewel, really, in terms of the, its culture and its, its heritage. And the university, I think, is fantastic, too. It's clear that there's a passion, both in terms of the academics I work with, both in terms of what I've heard today, in terms, uh, uh, specifically in terms of the, of the society, and obviously in the museum, too. And uh, Rob's mention of, uh, was it Shepherd's um, nightmare uh, uh, committee-led um, 
integration, I think is a great thing, actually. And that's exactly where I think we are now, and those opportunities still exist. As somebody who now leads a major univer uh, university academic department related to archaeology, classics, Egyptology, and heritage, I am very aware and conscious and very keen to engage with um, organizations like yourselves. And uh, Rob, in fact, has just been appointed for two days a week, and we were already discussing how we could make that a sustainable thing. And clearly, the way we do that and the way we want to do that is to actually engage very much with the local community. So it's been actually a very interesting morning for me and an afternoon. It's nice to meet some of you too, and it's very nice to see Norman again after so long. But I have no doubt, as I said just a minute ago, I kind of stole my final word, that there is, I have no doubt of where the uh, society is going to be in the next decades, because clearly it's already shown itself fit for purpose. It has evolved. It has dealt with the major um, impacts, evolutionary impacts, it is now passing on its genes and is fit for purpose, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me, and very good luck with the next 10 years.